right, that is a tough act to follow. Um, so my name is Kim Thompson. I'm program manager of Seafood for the Future at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Some of you may know me as the second string Jerry Schubel. Um, so we spend a lot of time, it's, it's a lot of people ask us as a conservation organization why we promote and support seafood. And we've heard a lot about this already today, but I'm going to go through some of these. And I just want to point out really quickly, though I'm thinking about it with Jacqueline, yes, those cute fuzzy animals do kill on social media. And I will tell you, those otters at the aquarium are my nemesis. Because last year during National Aquaculture Week, um, thank you, Noah, had uh, National Sea Otter Awareness Month at the same time. So aquaculture got one post. Sea otters got a whole week. I'm just saying. All right, so we know that seafood has uh, unique nutrients that support heart and brain health. It's a rich nutrient source of low-fat protein, um, and most Americans are not eating enough. We also know that there's a growing recognition of the potential for the oceans and freshwater to contribute significantly to food security and nutrition as this population does grow. We've also heard many times today, and I'm not vilifying beef. Beef is okay, but we do know that in terms of resource efficiency, marine aquaculture, when it's done the right way, can be produced using far fewer resources. The bottom line here is that we do need a more balanced way of eating food. And some people may be saying, well, why include meat in the scenario at all? And we get this a lot as a conservation organization. Why not just become a vegetarian? There's a few things that we have to keep in mind here. First of all, if we look at actual vegetarianism, fewer than 2% of Americans are vegetarians, and there is an 84% recidivism rate. Hi, I'm one of them. <laughs> Gave it a shot. <laughs> um, so we also have to consider that as the population grows, so too is, is global wealth. And the middle class is rising around the world. And with that, so is the Western diet and the demand for animal proteins. And that includes beef. And from a conservation perspective, again, if we remember this slide, we want people to eat less beef, not more of it. So bottom line is we do need to eat more seafood to support healthy ocean ecosystems and healthy people. But the question is how can we do this without compromising the health of the oceans? And we can do this. So it needs to be a balanced approach that includes well-managed wild capture fisheries and responsibly farmed seafood. But we do know that wild capture fisheries have very small capacity to expand. There are some fisheries under appropriate management um, around the world that could expand a little bit. But marine aquaculture is really the one of the two that has the ability and the opportunity to expand globally and really increase our, our seafood supply to meet the demand. And it doesn't have to be the bad guy. Uh, marine aquaculture, when it is done right, can be farming, food, and conservation. And this will require us having a diverse portfolio of different types of aquaculture. We need fin fish, seaweed, and shellfish to be a part of that portfolio. When we're thinking of, again, getting people maybe to reduce their beef consumption and replace it with some fish, it's much easier to get them to replace that with a fillet of fish than it is going to be for those slimy oysters and mussels. I love them. But I know a lot of you have had this experience with a first timer at a table getting them to eat the oyster. It's always a fun Instagram picture. Um, but people are a little squeamish around shellfish. So we need a diverse portfolio of all of these different production methods. And we need them to take into account the specific ecological carrying capacities of the regions, the cultures, the economics. Um, so there's a number of factors that have to go into this, but the bottom line is we do have the science and technological capacity, the information to do this. And specifically in the U.S., we do have a promising opportunity to increase our seafood supply while reducing reliance on imports. This does not have to replace wild capture fisheries. In fact, it should complement it, and it should also complement our strong agricultural industries. The U.S. is a global leader in environmental and food safety regulations, as was mentioned earlier. Streamlining the process does not have to mean getting rid of our regulations. It just means we make it an easier process so people don't have to go through so many barriers. And it's a little bit more economically efficient um, so we can get more people in. Um, and research does show that we have great potential to expand marine aquaculture within the United States exclusive economic zone, which is one of the largest in the world. So some of the roadblocks, though, that we have to expand marine aquaculture in the US we do have a complex permitting system. 
and public perceptions. Now these two are interconnected. You can't really tease them apart from each other. But the second one is really where we spend the bulk of our time to help get the first process uh, moving forward. So one of the things I want to talk about is with consumers, and I'm really glad that Jacqueline went first because she kind of set this up for me. Um, consumers are a really important public, and we do need to address things with consumers. But we also need to be strategic and look at how we're talking to consumers because the bottom line is, as Jacqueline mentioned, they're going to go off of price, quality, sometimes health will fall up there in the top three or four. Sustainability usually falls down at number six, seven, eight. The bottom line is if it's within their price range, if it tastes good, and they're already eating seafood or like seafood, then they're going to buy it. And one of the ways that we know that this is true is if you look at the top three consumed seafood items in the U.S., shrimp, tuna, and salmon. These guys have been on the naughty list of every seafood conservation program for the past 20 years, and yet they're still the top consumed seafood items in the U.S. Again, this does not mean we do not target consumers. Consumers are very important, especially from a health perspective. Um, but I do think we need to be very strategic in how we are approaching them and, and through what networks and channels we are doing that. But this is a really big one, and this is one that some people may disagree with. Um, but the public is a big topic. And these guys differ from consumers. So a consumer is someone who is actively buying seafood, whereas the general public, some of these guys might not even eat seafood. But they're very active and engaged in their communities. These are the people who are likely going to comment on US policies and regulations that are trying to move aquaculture forward. They're likely to come out if somebody's trying to get a permit. Um, they're likely to talk to the media. So while they are a small and concentrated group, um, and I would argue very well-meaning citizens, they're not always making decisions based on the most accurate facts. Um, and there was a recent study that found that a lot of the ne negative sentiment around marine aquaculture did appear from these concerned citizens and environmental groups. So this is really where we spend a lot of our time. So one of the hurdles that we have to get over is that the connection, there is no connection. It's disconnected in how we talk about it, right? So somebody could go to their local restaurant and hear from their waiter that they only carry wild seafood because farm seafood is bad. And then they go to their retail counter and their retail guy is like, hey, farm seafood is great. Look what I have. Um, and then they go home, they go on their app with their favorite organization and it says farm seafood is killing everything. Um, and then they come to the aquarium, and we mention it as an important conservation tool. So, of course, people are confused. So, imagine if we could start to build more cohesive messaging across these different stakeholder networks and having it be more accurate. So, the consumer, you're reducing the, the consumer and the public um, confusion around seafood, particularly with farm seafood. So at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we are not small potatoes in terms of an outreach venue. Uh, we have about 1.7 million annual visitors per year. Um, we're hoping this will expand. We have our expansion Pacific Visions, which I'll talk about in a few moments, and we're hoping to bump that up to about 2 million per year. Um, and we have a nice social media following as well, and then our Science on a Sphere program, which has about 137 additional sites in the US, Mexico, and, and around the world. And we've actually created an aquaculture program for that science on a sphere. It's a little outdated, but it still works. So some of the outreach that we've done at the aquarium include exhibits. So we did the Vanishing Animals exhibit, um, which you can see here. I don't know if the pointer's working, but the top one. So that was kind of a mock-up of what shellfish aquaculture looks like. We had some abalone in there. And then there too, what you can't see is there's actually a screen that had a short video that was playing about marine aquaculture. In the bottom there, you could see Mike Russ from NOAA. He was doing a virtual classroom where he had seventh and eighth graders, and it was a live interaction with them. Um, he got to play in front of the green screen, which was fun. Um, and like I mentioned, our science on a sphere. We've worked with um, the Art Center College of Design. We created a series of short videos, which are available on YouTube if you're interested. These are some preliminary sketches that they did for their cartoons. And it was really interesting to see how an artist um, looked at these topics and issues. Um, a lot of people learn visually, they learn through art. Uh, we have our aquatic academy, um, so we did one that featured um, aquaculture scientists, that's an adult 
lecture education series. It goes over a period of four different lectures. Um, we're actually holding one starting, I believe, mid to late October that will be on how we feed a growing population by 2100. Um, and that will include conversations on marine aquaculture as well as GMOs, CRISPR, um, and different technologies and how we can expand our food system, looking at the food, water, energy nexus and, and conservation. And then through Pacific Visions, which I had mentioned earlier, so that is our huge expansion. I'm really excited because the building and the architecture is coming in. So if you get a chance to look at it online, it's very exciting. Um, that will also feature looking at, again, how do we increase our food supply sustainably. So we're looking at it through the food, water, energy nexus. Um, and marine aquaculture will play a starring role in that. So the people working on the theater show are actually filming in Hawaii in another month or so to get the cage farms out there. Um, we're going to have some live animal exhibits that include an aquaculture cage looking type exhibit. We'll have um, oysters and we'll also talk about seaweed farming. So some other things that we're doing to bring these different efforts together. So there's a lot of great efforts underway. You know, Barton's got some great efforts. We've got NOAA that has some great efforts um, to educate different pockets of people about marine aquaculture. So we're really trying to help bring all of this together. We've been working really closely with NOAA. I have Cindy on speed dial. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so Coastal Ecosystem Learning Centers is run by NOAA's Office of Education, and it's a network of about 25 aquariums in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And they are trying right now to get these institutions on board with, again, more cohesive, accurate messaging about marine aquaculture. Um, it's, a, it's a slow process, um, and being in the aquarium world, I can tell you it is very hard. But I will say one of the cool things is when we first pitched this at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, it was actually Alaska that came to us first, so I was very excited about that. It was a coup. Uh, and then we have the Galway Perception Survey, which is an effort, again, we're working with NOAA Fisheries, and then it's also with the Canada and the European Union, and it's under the, the Galway Agreement, which is an agreement to protect the Atlantic Ocean and promote responsible use of its resources. So as you can imagine, with responsible use of resources, that includes talking about marine aquaculture. And so what that group had decided is, because perceptions are such, they can really impact how aquaculture proceeds and expands in these countries, they created a sub-working group with an aquaculture group just to focus on aquaculture and public perceptions. So we've been working with NOAA and others to create a landscape analysis assessment. Some of you may have taken it. If you did, thank you very much. Uh, and the results of that survey actually are going to come out at the end of October. And what that does is it kind of starts to fill in the gaps of who's talking about marine aquaculture. Is it negative or positive? Um, and what communication tools are they using to get this information out there? And then um, to kind of try to, again, bring all of these great efforts together, we are hosting the first in what we're hoping to be a series of forums at the aquarium on October 4th titled Aligning Stakeholder Communications for U.S. Marine Aquaculture. And basically we're going to be asking, again, kind of really extending, excuse me, extending the survey work where we're trying to figure out how do perceptions impact different groups. So we have farmers, we have chefs and retailers, we have regulators, and we have people who are trying to get permits. And we're going to talk about what communication tools are they currently using, what do they have available, and then what communications tools can we help create? What do they need moving forward? Um, and by the way, October 4th is a public event, so if you're interested, let me know. And then we have our Ocean to Table series, um, Stories of Food, Farming, and Conservation. I'm very excited about this series. Seafood Nutrition Partnership is a partner, as is NOAA. Um, so we got funding from USDC grant to educate the public about marine aquaculture. The idea with this series was really a couple of things. One, it was to let the public start to see and understand what marine aquaculture looks like in the U.S. What types of aquaculture are we doing in the U.S.? The second was to humanize the farmers um, and put a face to the farm so it wasn't just a faceless industry. And the third was to show the application of science to the farm. So the farmer is not just throwing a rock in the water saying, I'm going to farm here, I'm going to farm this species because I want to. Um, so we paired them with scientists so they could start to see that there is a connection there. 
Um, and then the last piece was the cooking piece. Um, because as Claudia mentioned, or Jacqueline mentioned, why do I keep doing that? Um, as Jacqueline mentioned, um, making it easier is always ideal, right? Because people are intimidated by fish. They don't know how to prepare it. And I would argue that's one of the major roadblocks from a consumer standpoint in terms of getting people to eat more seafood. So I want to show a short clip um, featuring some guy who pretends to know something about seafood. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it's short, I promise. It's a social media clip because I'm out of time. bring that up um, I will just say that so moving forward some of the things that we need to do we do need to work together across these different stakeholder groups oh I think it's coming up no it's not uh, so we need to get more information we need to work together and start having conversations to gather more information on potential alignment of, of, across the different stakeholder groups which includes you guys in this room um, communication tools and resource needs. So what do we already have and what do we need moving forward? Um, and then build those platforms to facilitate getting, first of all, creating the tools and then getting those tools out there. Um, so here it is. Okay, so now the tough questions for somebody like me. Going to the grocery store, what do I look for in terms of picking out my muscles to take home and cook? Well, if that's the tough question, life is easy. So, muscles are one of the easiest seafoods to buy. You go in, you want to see that the shells are intact. No broken shells. You want to see that they have a little sheen to them, that they're moist, that they've been kept moist. And importantly, you want to see that they're firmly closed like this. That indicates that the animal is still alive and still in a fresh state. All of the liquid, all of those wonderful juices and flavors are still in there. If you do see a muscle like this, because they do breathe air, if you just give it a tap, you will see that a live muscle will close. So, you don't want to see a whole lot of those in the bag, but the other good thing about seafood really is that the best way to determine the quality is if everything around it looks fresh and clean, chances are that this is going to be too. Sure, good indicator. Okay. Visit seafoodforthefuture.org for recipes and to learn more about marine aquaculture and the people who are innovating its future. I think with that, we should just bring up Barton. What? Can we have some mussels? <laughs> <laughs>